Hello, everyone. Um, this is Jeff Halper again, speaking to the ICAD community, but also, of course, speaking to each one of you. Uh, I don't know if it's good or bad, but we're a community that in which uh, it's small enough that we know everyone. Hopefully, it'll become big enough that we don't know everyone and we become much more effective politically. But I think we do a, a really important job as the ICAD community. I think we're out there at the cutting edge, both with our, with our analysis, but also with the political initiatives that we're that we're dealing with. And of course, uh, where ICAD, you know, ICAD has always been a political organization, as you all know. Um, and we've been very involved in working with our Palestinian partners in terms of developing the one democratic state campaign. So where we are today uh, is kind of in a very, very difficult in between sort of a situation that I just want to share with you, you know, because all these updates are meant um, in a way to be food for thought that come back into our discussions into our planning as an organization and as as a community. Um, you know, as you all know from the news, um, Israel, as I've said many times, is really in a mopping up operation. From the Israeli point of view, the conflict, as Israel calls it, or as everyone calls it, um, and we reject, of course, the idea of a conflict because a settler colonial project is unilateral. The settlers come in to take over the land. The indigenous population resists, of course, but they're not a side. There's no false, there's no symmetry here. Um, you know, uh, there's not a, a, a legitimate war. There's an illegitimate, unilateral settler colonial process. But nevertheless, we use the word conflict sometimes because that's sort of the, the common word that's used. From the Israeli point of view, the conflict is over. In other words, it's one. And what Israel is doing now is really nailing everything down. You know, the, 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 the ultimate goal of a settler colonial project, after you've taken over the country, after you've taken the land, after you've displaced the indigenous population, um, and after, in a way, as you're in the process of, of um, replacing the original country with the settler country, in other words, replacing Palestine with Israel. So you go to the travel agency and you buy a ticket to Israel. That's fine. Go try to buy a ticket to Palestine. You see, so all that's a part of and, the, and it ends up ultimately in normalization, where it's not only a fact on the ground, it's not only a political um, um, claim that this country belongs to us, but that everyone, the people living in the country, the settler population, the Israeli population, of course, and uh, people abroad, the international community, from just people to governments, all say, yes, this really is Israel. Okay, there's a conflict in, in, in the West Bank in certain areas with the Arabs or with Palestinians. I mean, Israel even tries to eliminate the term Palestinian and talks about Arabs all the time. Um, but you know, it's very localized. Uh, it doesn't challenge the Israeli settler project. Um, uh, you know, and so the idea is, okay, we have to resolve this conflict in areas A and B, and let's put up a little Palestinian authority, and let's maybe uh, give them a little autonomy here and there. In other words, the bigger picture, the bigger settler colonial project gets lost. And that's the process of normalization. And in the end, where Israel is going, and Israel, I think, believes that it's gone there already, it's already there, is to normalize the situation so that Israeli claims to the country are accepted and not just accepted again, but just seen as as reality. And at the same time, the Palestinians then have nowhere to go. And their resistance, in fact, is not considered resistance, because how can you resist a normalized situation? And so their resistance is very easy to prevent it as terrorism. So Israel today, in four ways, 
I would say, is mopping up, is, is trying to really finish uh, this whole situation and go on to this normalization stage. First of all, of course, are the facts on the ground. Um, uh, you know, there are 800, almost 800,000 settlers uh, in the occupied territories. If you include East Jerusalem, which is occupied territory, even though, again, the international community really, when they talk about occupation, don't talk about East Jerusalem. Um, and there are another 400,000 settlers in the West Bank. Well, the Selo Smotrich, who is this violent settler, um, who is today not only the Minister of Finance with all the financial resources at his disposal, but he's the Minister of Defense responsible for civilian affairs which means he's the minister of defense responsible for governing the Palestinian population and the settler population. In other words, that governance function has been severed from the military civil administration and given to him. So he's the one responsible for settler expansion, settlement expansion, expropriation of lands, house demolitions, and so on. And he's announced, and I think we talked about this last time actually, um, that there'll be from 400,000 settlers today in the West Bank, there'll be a million settlers within the next few years. And in fact, this last week, the parliament, the Knesset passed a bill, passed a law that says all planning now goes through Smotrich. In other words, and, and it doesn't need government approval and it's a much simpler process. And so really he's just opened the floodgates to massive construction in the occupied territories. Um, and that goes along, of course, with the pogroms that we've seen. I mean, pogroms is a word that even the Israeli military uses. These massive settler attacks on Palestinian communities, Tir Mosiah, um, 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 all, all the names are escaping me right now, uh, Huara, um, in other words, uh, there's been a number of Palestinian towns and communities that have been attacked by settlers, people killed, houses burned, cars built, burned, fields burned, I mean, millions of dollars worth of damage. Uh, and, and the point of pogroms, which are government sponsored, they could not happen without the convivience of both the army and the government, of course. So in a way, they're government sponsored. Maybe they haven't, they're basically given a green light. So this, they, don't, they don't necessarily tell the settlers where to go and when to go, but the settlers know they can go wherever they want, whenever they want to, they can do whatever they want to, and there will be no, 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 no consequences to that. So these government sponsored pogroms really have the same effect, or they're intended to, that the pogroms had in the 1880s and 90s and, and turn of the century in Russia against the Jews. That's where the term pogrom comes from, where attacks by, by Cossacks or by local populations in the Ukraine, in Russia, in the Pale of Settlement, sponsored by the governments uh, that were intended really to terrify the Jewish population and drive them out of the country, which in fact happened. That's where Jews from the, in the UK, in Canada, in the United States in particular come from. Th that particular period, that 20 year period of government sponsored pogroms, um, as the uh, Minister of uh, Interior of Russia said in those days, the formula is a third of the Jews will convert to Christianity and assimilate, a third of the Jews will die, and a third of the Jews will, will be driven out of the country. Um, Israel does not want conversion of Palestinians, of course, but I think the idea is that, uh, and, 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 I don't think Israel necessarily wants to kill all the Palestinians, although selective killing is a part of the pogrom uh, terror campaign, but it certainly is using, it's using the pogroms to drive the Palestinians out of the country and, um, uh, and, to, and of course to assert a claim to the land and at the same time to quell any opposition. The idea is zero tolerance. In other words, any resistance Will be, will be met in a massive way. For example, when there was a, an attack uh, a, a couple of weeks ago and four Israeli settlers were killed in the settlement of Ali, of Eli, 
the response of the Israeli government and Netanyahu announced this was to build a thousand new housing units in this settlement, uh, uh, you know, near the attack. So that's part of the strategy as well. In addition to that, of course, um, Israel is normalizing itself. It, uh, you know, um, um, in other words, uh, uh, the first form of normalization of mopping up are these facts on the ground. The settle is the set, second is military, quelling any kind of resistance. The third is political in terms of international, uh, normalizing Israel internationally. And here we have the United States that's pushing very much to normalize relations to complete the Abraham Accords that Trump and Netanyahu began. Normalizing relations between Israelis, uh, between Israel and the Arab world. Saudi Arabia be, being the, being the big uh, missing piece. And so the United States has announced a whole campaign to normalize, to finish this normalization process with no reference whatsoever to Palestinians. This is a part of the normalization. Israel, Israel is the only party on the one side and the Arab world are the only party on the other side. And if we can normalize, we resolve the conflict because the conflict is not defined by Palestinians. In fact, Palestinians really even aren't a side. They're, uh, they're kind of a byproduct or, a, or an afterthought uh, to this whole process. So Israel, with the help of the United States and Europe, of course, is in the process of normalizing in terms of international politics. And finally, Israel is normalizing itself legally. In term, Israel is very adept at manipulating international law. The big problem, certainly the PR problem facing Israel in terms of normalizing is this, this idea that it's becoming an apartheid state, that Amnesty, Human Rights Watch, B'Tselem, the Israeli Human Rights Organization, uh, the UN even, uh, and others have really documented in detail that indeed it is a, a, an apartheid regime. So it has to fight that as kind of the last little piece to, uh, to, to deal with on the way to normalization. And so Israel's invented did this years ago, it's never been accepted by the international community, <clears throat> but it doesn't matter because Israel wins anyway. Israel's invented a new legal doctrine. You know, international law says that you cannot annex an occupied territory. In other words, you, you, it's prohibited to acquire territory by force. We're not in the world anymore where countries go out and conquer territories. You can't do that. The only way to dispose of an occupied territory is through negotiation. Well, and you and by the Fourteen of the Convention, of course, you can't build settlements in occupied territories. You can't harm the population. You can't harm their economy. You can't stop their freedom of movement. You can't, uh, you know, you can't move your civilian population in. You can't demolish the homes of the indigenous. Uh, they're a protected people. That's the term in the Fourteen of the Convention. So if, in fact, international law holds, and this is an occupation, um, then Israel's in violation, clearly, of international law that it's always been anyway. Uh, but it's also on the way to apartheid, which adds another layer of violation to international law. So in the way Israel fights that is legally. Israel's invented a doctrine that's called the doctrine of the missing reversionary. How's that for a term? The idea being that in international law, any territory that's occupied, that's beyond your borders, that you're, you've occupied militarily, is occupied territory. And the only way to dispose of it is through negotiation. Right? Well, Israel says no. The definition of, a, of occupation is when one sovereign state conquers the territory of another sovereign state. And since there was never a sovereign state, in the West Bank or Gaza, you have a missing reversionary. There's no one to, to revert it back to. There's no one to, to it with or give it back to because, uh, because you know, before Israel, which is an occupied where you had Jordan in the West Bank and Egypt in Gaza, where they were occupying powers. Before that, it was a British mandate. Before that, it was the Ottoman Empire. So there never was a sovereign. And therefore, Israel's claims are good, just as good as everyone else. And since we have the Bible on our side, 
that Israel brings into these discussions, uh, our claims are, are more justified than anyone else's. And of course, again, what's missing from this doctrine are the Palestinians. In other words, the fact that the indigenous population had no sovereignty. But we have to remember that in the, in the, in the context of European colonialism, you know, where, they're, you know, where uh, they were denied the sovereignty that they should have gotten, uh, that Israel got, that the Jews got, of course the Palestinians have no sovereignty. Um, but from the, this doctrine then eliminates the Palestinians as a, as a political side with any political rights whatsoever. So in all these ways, Israel is normalizing, and that's really the situation that we that we uh, that we face. And I know this is getting long, so let me just finish uh, on this. And that is that this really raises real questions for us. Um, how do we, at the same time, fight not every single element of the occupation? In other words, there's campaigns about Sheikh Jarrah, there's campaigns about Khan al Ahmer. There's campaigns uh, about the wall, about settlements, about you know the BDS and everything else. But these are all rear action, very localized little campaigns. They don't get at this big ending of the colonial project that Israel is engaged in today and where the Palestinians are. Part of the problem is that it's become very hard. It is very hard for Palestinians to organize on a national basis. There is no more PLO. The PA is a, is, is, is a hostile entity in collaboration with Israel, but they're in the process of doing that. So one of the things, and we'll talk about this in future, uh, in future uh, updates and conversations, in a sense, part of our job then as international, or in our case, uh, Israeli, anti-Zionist Israeli supporters of Palestinian rights, is to give the Palestinians a political space in which they can begin, they can continue to organize and become a strong political force in and of themselves. They don't have a counter political program yet. They don't have a PLO regenerate, re, uh, you know, revived yet. They don't have a national leadership yet. And so uh, in a way, part of our solidarity has to be giving them that political space. Well, at the same time, and this is what ICAD tries to do, and this is what I tried to do today, to present the big picture of what's going on. Not, not each individual thing, but for people to understand what settler colonialism is, how it works, the normalization process, and within that larger political analysis, to understand what's going on today in the way that I set it out. So I think this is ICANN's job, and we together as a community, have to figure out how to get these bigger messages, because they tend to be, as you can hear, <laughs> long, <laughs> academic. But you know, this is the meat of it all. This is the substance. How do we get these analyses across? This is part of our challenge. I'll leave it at that <laughs> for today. Again, sorry I went on so long, but I think this is really an important, uh, uh, this is a central mission uh, of ICAD today getting political and supporting the Palestinians in a meaningfully uh, political uh, sort of a way to be continued. Goodbye all.